British Columbia is dealing with one crisis after another. The province has been hit by a deadly heat wave and an extreme wildfire season just as the COVID pandemic is easing. There are currently more than 300 active fires in B.C. The red dots show wildfires that are out of control. The yellow ones are being held and green dots are fires that are under control. More than two dozen pose a threat to public safety or are highly visible. This morning, hundreds of properties in the Caribou region were ordered to evacuate. Minister Farmworth, welcome to the show. My pleasure. You, you've got more than 300, I think it is, active wildfires across your province as of right now and, and no real end in sight to the hot, dry summer. So do you have a sense on when you might be able to get this under control? Uh, there's about uh, 306 uh, fires right now. Uh, there are 20 of them are note, which means that their interface where structures and, and populations are, are, are living. Uh, there's currently um, a number of uh, states of emergency, um, local states of emergency, about 19 evacuation orders, and there's about 835 uh, properties affected by that at this point in time. Um, what is critical, though, is ensuring that we've got uh, the, the, uh, the, the firefighters on the ground and the resources uh, to, to fight these fires, and that is, in fact, in place right now. Uh, we have an agreement with uh, the federal government uh, in terms of their supplying uh, aircraft through the, uh, the Canadian Armed Forces. Uh, we're receiving resources from the uh, international uh, or the uh, uh, agency in, in Winnipeg, which is coordinating resources from across Canada in terms of personnel. Uh, we've accessed uh, uh, firefighters from our international uh, agreements that we have with places such as Australia and in this case, uh, Mexico. And we have over almost 2,700 firefighters right here in British Columbia on the ground right now. So there's a lot of resources uh, to, to tackle these fires. Of course, it's all related to things such as wind and weather and thunder and lightning and, of course, human caused, uh, human -caused fires. So you, I want to make sure I heard you right. Did you say there are 19 evacuation orders, as in 19 municipalities uh, have been told to? There are, there are 19 evacuation orders. Exactly, there are 19 evacuation orders, and they can they cover um, they can cover areas in regional districts. They can cover areas in communities. Uh, most of them are in, in regional districts at this point, and there's about 835 properties uh, that are that are affected by the orders. And then, of course, there are uh, about 38 evacuation alerts in place. Uh, for people uh, that, uh, that that they don't have to leave at this point, but they should potentially uh, be prepared to, uh, to to leave. Is there any particular community that would be most at risk right now? I mean, we've all seen the horrible images out of Lytton, and certainly nobody wants to see anything like that happen again. But is there any town that could be in proximity to, to a severe risk like Lytton was? There are, there are communities, uh, large and small, throughout the interior of British Columbia, uh, and the fire service uh, monitors very closely the situation regarding uh, each fire. Uh, we've got the big fire that is north of, uh, just north of Kamloops, the Sparks Lakes fire. Uh, we had a, a fire uh, a couple of days ago in Coldstream, uh, where an evacuation order and evacuation alerts. Uh, that fire is now under control. Um, so it, it, it changes, literally, it can change from, from hour to hour. Uh, but so uh, we have uh, uh, an incredible uh, you know, fire service here in British Columbia, uh, BC Wildfire Service, that does an amazing job. We had a statement from the Prime Minister's office saying it's looking at information sharing with communities and inclusivity in emergency management systems. And we know that you've admitted to gaps in emergency management planning when it comes to First Nations. What are some of the, the, the holes in your emergency response that, that have been exposed by this crisis? That was at the very beginning as it related to the, uh, in particular, to the Lytton fire. Uh, since that's time, um, I've made it clear that uh, communications is critical. Uh, we've established uh, tables uh, with a number of First Nations uh, in terms of, of rebuilding uh, and ensuring uh, and recovery uh, in, uh, in, for example, the community of Lytton. At the same time, ensuring that communications are taking place with First Nations. So, for example, um, when a um, um, an evacuation order is is issued, it's the local government that does it, and it's uh, and it's the same with a First Nations government. It's the First Nations. Uh, uh, will decide when an evacuation order for their community is in place. And we want to make sure that communications are, are, are paramount and that there's good information flow. And um, 
that's uh, been a, a, a key priority now since the beginning of the fire, and in particular since the Litton fire. So, so the size and strength of these fires is kind of a knock-on effect of, of the extreme heat we, we saw earlier this year, or, uh, and, and which led to, I think, 719 deaths, uh, uh, sudden deaths caused by heat in your province. And, and in that situation, many people were waiting hours for emergency services to arrive. So I, I'm wondering, did the problems fall short in some ways in, in, in dealing with the the medical crisis that was caused by the extreme heat that British Columbia suffered? The, the heat that we saw in British Columbia was unprecedented, and in particular as it relates to the lower mainland, uh, where the vast majority of the heat-related deaths um, uh, in fact occurred. And currently right now we have the coroner, the BC coroner, is doing a review of all, uh, uh, all deaths uh, to determine the cause and, and in relation to uh, the heat uh, dome uh, that we, we experienced. And she will be coming out with a report uh, and review and no doubt recommendations, which we will be uh, anxiously waiting to, to receive. Uh, there was a lot of work that was done in particular as it related to long-term care facilities, for example, institutions and hospitals. And I think what, what we are seeing and what we're hearing happened was it was people uh, living in, you know, often uh, condominiums or alone, uh, often without air conditioning, um, that that's where uh, the vast majority of the, the fatalities took place. But as I said, we're waiting for the coroner's report and reviewing the recommendations that will flow from that. You've also, if I remember correctly, said that you're, you're reviewing your Emergencies Act and you were going to do this sort of uh, anyway to sort of to deal with some of the lessons of the pandemic. But the, the consequences of things like extreme heat will be something that could be incorporated into the into the review in terms of how to deal with the consequences of, of climate change. So, so what are the sort of things you think you might need to add to your Emergencies Act to deal with, you know, serious crisis like we saw with the heat dome? Well, first, our, our Emergencies Act had been in place since 93, 1993, and it was, in, in fact, uh, based on the uh, war measures legislation uh, from the 60s. Uh, so the work in terms of reviewing it has been underway uh, now for just over a year in terms of uh, consultation, looking at, at, at what we need to address. We are the first province outside of the federal government to sign up to the, uh, to acknowledge, to sign to the, uh, what's called a Sendai agreement in terms of disaster management and it's the framework in which you approach disaster management and recovery. Um, and so the work has been going on, not just in the context of forest and, uh, of, of fires and floods, but also the lessons we've learned from the pandemic, lessons we'll learn from the, uh, from the, the, the heat emergency that we had uh, and also, you know, the, the, this current this current fire season. So a lot of it will focus on how do we build back better? Uh, what additional prevention measures uh, uh, need to be in place? Uh, clarification of roles and responsibilities. Mm -hmm. um, roles in terms of, of, of ensuring, you know, First Nations, uh, uh, Indigenous peoples, uh, and we've got, you know, uh, UNDRIP uh, now in place in British Columbia, bringing them all together uh, so that we have the most up-to-date, modern uh, emergency uh, uh, program act uh, in the country. Uh, and it's been a significant amount of work. It's not just a review, it's a complete overhaul and rewrite. Uh, and that work is continuing ongoing, and it's my expectation uh, that we will have uh, that in place uh, uh, for spring of next year. But when you look at, I guess, the, the lessons and the experiences of the past year, uh, from the pandemic to the heat dome, is there one thing you look at this say, this is a legislative power, a legal authority that I needed that I did not have to deal with these particular crises? The reality is I don't think it's necessarily a legislative power. What it is is ensuring that all the powers that, that are available are, are there in the right place, at the right time, and, and everybody is working together and knows what their roles and responsibilities are. Those, and I think that's pretty crucial. Uh, and ensuring that, that in terms of, you know, whether it's indigenous nations, whether it's local government, whether it's the provincial government, whether it's the federal government, that, that we all understand what the roles and responsibilities are. And then on top of that, it's things such as mitigation, how do we prevent uh, uh, these kinds of events from, from happening? Or at least if we know they're going to happen, mitigate their effects. And at the same time, when it comes to building back, do we just continue to build back the same way we did before? Or do we recognize, you know what, there needs to be some real systemic changes take place in terms of, of, of building back. And we've already seen some small examples of that take place already uh, in Grand Forks, for example, where a neighborhood was flooded out uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the terrible flooding they had a couple of years ago, and the neighborhood was relocated. 
Uh, these are the kinds of things that, uh, that we need to be looking at and having a, a more thorough understanding uh, in terms of the hazards that we're facing, not just in, in the case of flood and pandemic, but you know, how climate change is, is impacting all of these things. Okay, well, Minister, good luck with that review and, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.